Thanks for joining with us here today. Today we uh, launch and start a new series uh, called Jesus Has Something to Say to His Church. And uh, I know this phrase has been said a lot um, this week, but there's a couple of things I've heard. Uh, it's been hard for sports fans in the Northwest. <laughs> Last Sunday I said, man, the Seahawks could make it to the playoffs. The Huskies could win a national championship. And none of us knew we would lose both and lose both our coaches. That's a tough week. We'll get over that, though. And then it's cold this week, isn't it? Man, it's cold. And I've got a dog that he doesn't know when it's cold. He doesn't know when it's raining. He doesn't know when it's not good to go on a walk. And so he begs every day. And so I took him on a walk yesterday. And I bundled up. And, and we walked. And, and uh, it wasn't too bad. I'm like, oh, it's cold, but it's not that cold. And then we reached our end point and we turned around and I quickly realized the wind had been at my back the whole time. And now the wind was blowing in my face. And I'm like, oh, this is cold, like bitter bone cold. And uh, I thought about just stopping and calling my wife and asking her to come pick me up. But I knew I would never hear the end of it. And so we trudged on going forward. And, and today we are going to take a, a look at the book of Revelation. And we're beginning a series called Jesus Has Something to Say to His Church, where we're going to be looking at the first part of Revelation here, where uh, God has given a revelation to John, and he's writing these letters to seven churches in, in seven different cities. And, and uh, maybe you've missed something before, and you realize later that it was important. Maybe it was a missed phone call that you wish you would have taken. Maybe you've had the unfortunate experience of missing a bill in the mail. And all of a sudden you get like a late payment or the bills double next month. You're like, oh, I don't know how I missed that. Maybe it was a missed opportunity. Anyone here, I just need to know, anyone heard the name Ronald Wayne before? Anyone ever heard the name Ronald Wayne? Nobody. Good. Let me tell you about Ronald. <laughs> Uh, him and two other friends, businessmen, decided to start a company together. Now, Ronald was a little more experienced and had, had more success and had more uh, money with him. And, and so they began dreaming of what this company could be, what they could create. And so Ronald, having a little more experience, drew up the business agreement. They had some investors and, and he divvied out their portion to these other two business partners. And, and they decided what this company was going to be. He even drew a logo for this company. But as the oldest and most financially secure, as they began to realize what this was going to cost to do, he became concerned that all the company's business debts would ultimately fall on him. So just 12 days into the formation of this company, he sold his 10% stake in the company for $800 to his business partners. That logo he drew was one of an apple his business partner, one of them whose name was Steve Jobs. And what he sold his portion of business for would be worth billions of dollars today. But yet he didn't realize the value and he was fear of the risk going forward. And so he decided to opt out. He decided to back away, to take his $800 and run. And when it comes to the book of Revelation, I found that there's two types of people. There's two types of believers in Jesus. There's those that just say, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I'm out. And there's those that try to understand every little detail and they go way too far. And they begin trying to interpret everything and they make claims that they have all the answers. So much so, there was a guy that wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Returning in 1988. <laughs> Some of you might remember that. And what happened? 1988 came and went. So do you know what he did? He wrote 89 reasons why Jesus was coming back in 1989. He's like, I just missed it by a year. I missed one thing. And he was so sure that he had all the answers. And, and, and we're people that like to have all the answers. We like to know the future. We like to think of, of what could happen. I mean, how many of you have had the dream of, of Back to the Future and having the sports almanac that, that Biff had, you know, that then he came back in time and knew all the ways the playoffs and things would go? Some of you are like, 
Biff, back to the future. Oh, it hurts that you don't know. <laughs> but because of the obscure, the unknown and even lack of understanding, the misuse and even man's and even preacher's false proclamations of revelations, many believers can miss the importance of it. The gift that it is to the church. A letter that's designed to be a blessing to us. You see, Jesus has a church and he has something to say to his church. And sometimes when we get to the idea that we're going to spend time in, in Revelation, some of you are like, yeah, let's go. And some of you are like, oh, I'm going to miss a few weeks. <laughs> but we're not going to try to decode things. You're not going to come in next week and everyone's going to have decoder glasses as we look at scripture and tinfoil hats and trumpets. Like that's not what we're doing. We're not going to look at all the future events of life and try to make sense of what we are now experiencing and how that impacts things like the end times. We are going to look at what scripture has made clear. One of the things about prophecy, which the book of Revelation is, is prophecy is only fully understood on the other side of fulfillment. When you look at the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus, they weren't understood until the moment Jesus fully fulfilled them. And it's like, oh, that's what it's talking about in, gener in, gen in Genesis chapter 1 when, or in Genesis chapter 3 when they say that he's going to send a Savior and, and the, his heel is going to be striked and the head of the serpent is going to be crushed. They didn't understand what that meant until Jesus came and died on the cross and he was pierced, but yet death was not victorious over him and he defeated Satan once and for all. We get that now. But we're on the other side of the prophecy, of the story. Many people wonder, are we living in the end times? Are these the last days? Is Jesus coming back soon? What exactly is the mark of the beast? Is our next president the Antichrist? If I have a 5G phone or Apple Pay, am I guilty of having the mark of the beast? And although Revelation does deal with the end... It's a book that's designed to build hope in the followers of Jesus. See, this is exactly what it's done for thousands of years. Through trial, through times of persecution, through times of being at odds with governments and societies. Even now across the world to the church that's hidden underground. The book of Revelation is a book of hope. And one thing it continues to reinforce over and over. And I think one thing that Christians miss a lot of times when they're looking at the book of Revelation and the theme is present and it's apparent and it's this, Jesus is victorious. Jesus is victorious. And our victorious king is coming again and will set all things right. And one thing that we might not understand is that the first part of Revelation, Jesus is talking to his church. Very real churches in very real cities navigating very real circumstances. And here's what we discover from this. This message of Jesus spoke to the first century church. And this message spoke to the church throughout history. And this message is designed to continue to speak to us today. And so Jesus has something to say to his church. And the title of the message today is Don't Miss It. Don't miss it. Don't ignore it. Don't opt out. You know, we often hear say things like, it's Jesus' church. But what does that actually mean? And in the coming weeks, as we go through each letter written to each church, this letter was written directly to a church, but then these letters were passed around because what we find is we all share some of the same similar problems and challenges as humans. And the first thing that we'll see in every letter is that there's an understanding of Jesus' character. You see, when we look at the book of Revelation, we look at all of Scripture, it's not about finding us in Scripture. It's about seeing who God is. It's about seeing His character and how He interacts with humanity and, and, and how we can become people of godly character. We also see a word of commendation or praise. God and Jesus will point out what's good, what's right. How many people like encouragement? Man, I love encouragement. It's one of my favorite things about our lead pastor, Pastor Tyler Soley. He is one of the most encouraging people I've ever been with. 
the most encouraging person I've ever worked with. And so whenever I have a meeting with him, my wife's like, when are you going to be home? I said, as soon as he's done encouraging me. <laughs> I'll stay until his encouragement runs out. I just can't get enough. But also not, not just a word of commendation, but then a word of criticism for sin. You see, we are all imperfect people and Jesus' church can, is full of imperfect people. And he'll remind them of the ways that they are living for themselves or not living for God. And he will bring a word of critique, reminding them, this is not who I've called you to be. This is not how I've designed you to be. And you are not being a reflection of me. And so with that, Criticism comes correction. He doesn't just point out what's wrong. He points the pathway forward towards what's right, what's good, what's holy. And then he closes with a challenge and a promise. Challenging his church that if you will step up, if you will rise up, if you will become, here's what you will see. And so in the next few weeks, we're going to be taking a look at each letter and what Jesus has to say to his church. But today we're going to be in Revelation chapter 1, and I encourage you to open uh, your Bibles to this. And it's a little prologue, it's a little introduction, it's John's vision of how he got this. And the big idea for today's message is this, is Jesus is still speaking to his church. He's not done. And Revelation, it's an interesting opening, and we'll read it here in just a moment. But it's a book that opens, that talks about a direct blessing for those who read it, Listen to it and obey it. John says, hey, if you'll read this, if you'll listen to what it says and obey it, you will be blessed. So followers of Jesus, this means that we do not avoid it. We do not dismiss it. We do not ignore it. And we don't say, I'm not smart enough to get it. To do that is to dismiss the promised blessing. And we don't approach Revelation with fear. We don't approach it with decoder glasses or claiming to have all the answers. The purpose of this letter was to provide comfort and courage to the church. And the purpose is still to provide comfort and courage to the church. Why courage, pastor? Well, because when you read through the book of Revelation, it gets bad. The world gets bad. And not just bad, bad, bad. And not just bad, bad, like bad, 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 like really, really bad, and then some more bad, and then on top of that, another layer of bad, and then bad, 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 and then bad, and then everything's good. Like, that's the thing, but the, the whole theme through it is no matter how bad it gets, no matter how hard it gets, the comfort is Jesus wins. Our God reigns. He is victorious. And so no matter how bad it appears, God is in control. He reigns and he's supreme and his church and his people will make it through even how difficult it gets. No matter how difficult it gets. And Revelation is unique because it's got kind of three elements to it. First, it's prophetic. It speaks to the future. It speaks to what is to come. It speaks to what will unfold and take place. It also is apocalyptic. It speaks to the end and the destruction of this world and of evil and of people who are, their hearts are bent away from God. It also speaks to the hope of the church, of those who trust and believe in him. It's apocalyptic. But yet I think the thing we miss the most is that it's pastoral. It's a pastoral letter. It's the letter from God's heart to prepare his church to be ready. To be ready for what is. To be ready for what is to come. And to not lose hope in the midst of difficulty. In the midst of suffering. And it midst when it seems like evil is winning. You see, it's comfort because Jesus is victorious and rescues his people from it all. And not just for a moment, but forevermore. So you ready to see what Jesus has to say to his church? Are you ready? Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. 
It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Verse 3 talks about the blessing. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. Verse 4. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever Amen. Little disclaimer. There is not the amount of time on Sunday morning to hit every detail in the next seven weeks. What we're going to hit is what Jesus has made clear to his church. The heartbeat and message that he wants us to see and hear. And we see in this introduction, the first thing we see is the exalted Jesus. The introduction and focus is on who Jesus is, his power and his authority. And Revelation, it does address the future, but it's focused on exalting Jesus. And so many get focused on the symbolic that they miss what is clear. And there are symbols in Revelation and there are these important things. And and, and there's going to be another time when we will have a class and we'll walk through that. But for Sunday mornings, we're going to hit on what's clear here. And what we see in this introduction is that Jesus is supreme. There is no one like him. We see that Jesus is victorious. He has had victory over sin, victory over death. We see that he is the faithful witness, that what he speaks is true about God, about creation, and about humanity. And we see that he conquered death. Revelation chapter 1 says it this way, that Jesus is the firstborn to conquer death. But he's not the lastborn to conquer death. He's the first. He's the first to say death is no longer final. Death no longer has this victory. Jesus became victorious over death. And he was the firstborn to die and to live again. And his promise is that anyone who believes in him, even though they may die, they will live. And so he's the firstborn, but our invitation is to become others that are born again and born new, that death does not have to be final. And Jesus' victory over death assures that his promise is true. For those who claim that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, death is no longer the end. But death becomes the entranceway into the gift of God, eternal salvation in his presence. And so many times we struggle with death because it seems so final. And death is final for those that do not believe in Jesus. There is no hope for more after this life if your life is not found and your faith is not found in Jesus Christ. Your body will die and your soul will be consigned to eternal punishment, which is separation from God. Which if you wonder what the punishment is, the punishment is being separated from the almighty God forever. That's the greatest punishment, to not be in his presence forever. But for those who put their faith in him, death becomes the doorway or the entrance into a new life, into a fullness of life and being in his presence forever. And Jesus' sacrifice on the cross displayed his love that sets us free. In chapter 1, uh, verse, verse uh, 5 here, it says, To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood. It's the blood of Jesus that sets you free, and it's the blood of Jesus that keeps you free. It's his blood that, that was shed on the cross, the perfect lamb of God, 
who without the shedding of blood, there is no payment for sins. But because his blood was shed, there is full payment for sins. And not just full payment. He, it, it's just payment that not just frees you for a moment, but can free you for a lifetime. And so many times, so many people, they give their life to Jesus, but they stay chained by their sins. They go back to their old patterns and their old habits. And Jesus wants to give you life that covers you and forgives you, but also sets you free. And that's why God's given us each other. Because we need each other to help walk that out. That's why he's given us ministries like Celebrate Recovery and why we have prime timers and, and, and men's and women's ministry and youth ministry and children's ministry to be in community with one another. To help remind each other that there's more for us. That what used to define us no longer has to define us. And that God has not only forgiven us, but he set us free by his love. You see, his death on the cross not only covers our sin, but it frees us from the grip of sin. And when you see an exalted Jesus, you see that there is nothing that hinders him any longer. Not the constraints of this world. Not the punishment of sin which he endured for us, but he is exalted, he is glorious, and he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It goes on in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 through 8 to say, Look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. The second thing we see is we look for his coming. His church should eagerly anticipate the return of the Lord. John says, look, that word look means to be actively looking, searching, ready for his second coming. It says, look, he comes on the clouds. And what's it say? It doesn't just say those who believe in him will see him. It says the whole earth will see him. It says all tribes will mourn. Because when he comes back, he's coming back for his bride. He's coming back for his church. And he's coming back to deal a final blow to sin, evil, and wickedness once and for all. To rid it from the earth. To call his bride home. And to destroy evil once and for all. And it says all the tribes will mourn. There'll be sadness for those who are not ready. For those who are not prepared. For those who do not yet believe in him. And Jesus' return, it's his promise. He's promised to return. And as you look throughout scripture, whenever God has made a promise, he fulfills it. And we can look at scripture and see much of the Old Testament as promises made. And much of the New Testament as promises kept. That God fulfills his promises. And so Jesus' return is not just a hope, it's an assurance. It's a promise that his church has. And so you must be ready at any moment. We must live ready. It's not that we're getting ready, we are ready. Because if there's one thing you don't want to miss, it's when he returns. Now we don't live with fear, we live with anticipation. My grandmother lived with anticipation that she, would receive, that she would see the return of the Lord in her life. And but she grew up in a culture where there was some things taught that if you were doing this when Jesus came back, he's not bringing you with him. And one of those things was going to a movie theater. And so movie theaters were seen as places that Christians did not ever go. And when you're 95 years old, she just passed away this two weeks ago, 95 years old. I mean, so the 1920s and the 1930s were her growing up and she was born in a sod house in Kansas. Her life was drastically different than mine, but she never went into a movie theater because her parents told her, if you're in a movie theater, when Jesus comes back, he's not coming in to get you. <laughs> that place is dark. The movies they show are awful in that place. And so don't find yourself in that place. What did that do? That caused fear in her. It developed fear in her to where she would never step foot in a movie theater until she was in her 80s. And my parents brought her to her first movie to see The Passion of the Christ. And she's watching a movie about Jesus dying on the cross. And she's looking around to make sure no one in there knows her. <laughs> 
She's praying, Lord, forgive me. If you come back, please take me. You see, there's so many times that we create human-made rules and regulations that drive fear into people's heart. Now, there is a warning. We should live ready. There should be sin that we abstain from so that we present ourselves holy and pure before God, not because of our righteousness, but because we've received his righteousness and it's transformed us that we no longer want to be a part of sin. That there's things of this world that we no longer want to engage in because he set us apart as righteous and holy. And so we live ready. He said, Pastor, Scripture here says the time is near, but it feels like it's been a long time. I'd say you're right. Depends whose eyes you're looking at that through, though. You see, I've got a six-year-old, and we told them months ago that we're, that we're taking them to Disneyland soon. In her mind, I'm a liar. Because her soon and my soon are different. And my soon's not soon enough. And so because my soon doesn't match with her soon, my soon is not true. And that's not true. We have different perspectives. And isn't it amazing how you get older, how perspectives change? Well, can I tell you between you who is earthly and God who is eternal, soon means very different things. And his soon is not a lie. His soon is just different than humanity soon. And his return is near. Well, pastor, how near is it? Here's what I know. We're closer today than we were yesterday. That's how close we are. That's how close we are. Well, pastor, you see all the things in the world. I do. But every generation has been convinced that they would receive, see the return of the Lord. And I'm convinced that we could. I'm also convinced that I may live out my life. And that gives me a responsibility. I live out my life ready, looking, but also with an urgency of this gospel. You see, his soon was designed to give an urgency in his church so they wouldn't kick back in lazy boys and, and drop the responsibility on their shift. So they wouldn't leave it to a future generation. Well, if, if Jesus said he was coming back in 500 years, would the church lose its urgency? Would it lose its imperative to tell people about the good news of Jesus, to grow and expand and have influence? Because here's what I know. When we think we have time, we move slow. That's why your job creates deadlines for you. They create objectives because they know if they don't, you won't. And in order for things to get done, there's a sense of urgency and timeline. And Jesus says, and God promises that he's going to return soon. Why? So his church would be urgent with the message. They would understand their responsibility in their moment. And so we look for his coming. Pastor Alan Johnson says it this way. Jesus' return is possible any day, impossible no day. So it could be any day, and it could be today. It could be a week from now, and it could be today. And we live with the reality of both. In verse 9, he continues. And say, I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction... What a joyful statement. Your brother and partners in the affliction. What John's saying, hey, I understand it's hard for me, and I know it's hard for you. We are partners in what's hard, in what's difficult, in what's counterculture, in, what's, in, in this challenging moment in the kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus. It takes a lot to run this race. It takes a lot to keep going. It takes a lot to get up every day and say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm not going to choose the desires of my flesh, but I'm going to feed the desires of my spirit. He was on an island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The island of Patmos was a prison camp. It was a place that they sent prisoners to be isolated from the community. 
And he's been sent there. Why? Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. If the most difficult places you end up are because of your faithful service to Jesus, that's an okay place to be. Because of the word and testimony. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now don't miss this. He's in a place of difficulty physically, but his spirit is connected to the almighty God supernaturally. And so no matter what your external circumstances are, you can be in the presence of God, even in the most difficult place, even in that place of affliction, even in that place of pain, even in that place of struggle, God will meet you there. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are the seven churches we're going to be looking at the letters that he writes. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that, that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was one like the son of man. Dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair on his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine like bronze and his fired in a furnace and his voice like the sound of the cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand and a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. What a powerful statement. What a powerful depiction. And the third thing is we are to behold his power and glory. When John heard this voice, he turned around. And not only did he hear a voice of clarity and power, but he saw the victorious Jesus. And Jesus did not lose his power nor his authority, but he was fully operating it. And Jesus is not just the king who will reign. He is the king who is reigning. Yeah. It's not just that he's going to come and make all things right and reign for a thousand years with peace. He is reigning. God is still in control. God is still sovereign. And even when it looks like chaos is at the forefront of this world, when there's evil and so many different things, God is still in control. His plan is still unfolding. We see Jesus glorious in his description, full of strength, beauty, power, and authority. And he's not waiting till Jesus comes back to take control. He's sovereign today and he will redo, redeem and renew all things. But his word to John said, don't be afraid. I am the first and last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. The first and last, the Alpha and the Omega, the A to Z. What he starts he finishes. He is the God of creation. He's also the God that brings an end to evil. And he's the God of the new creation. He's the living one. He said, I was dead, but I am alive. What a statement. I was dead, but now I'm alive. Not only alive, I'm alive forever and ever. And if John were to keep writing, he'd say, I'm alive forever and ever and ever. And ever and ever, what the enemy tried to bring an end to, he cannot end any longer. I'm alive forever and ever. And then he says this. He says, I hold the keys. I hold the keys of death and Hades. Death claims the body. And Hades claims the soul. And Jesus has the key. And what is this implying? That there is a doorway. That there is a doorway to life in God. And where we used to be shut out because of our sin and where death was for our body and hell and eternal punishment was for our soul, Jesus opened that door. He unlocked it through a sacrifice and he made a way where there seemed to be no way. He opened a door to life forevermore for each and every person to the point where death does not have to be our end. But, and if you put your faith in God, he makes a way for you. And so what's our response? What's the invitation? 
When Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and set us free from our sins by his blood. Verse 6, it says this, And has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. What does being a priest to God mean? He has made us priests to God. What was the priest's job? The priest's job was to go on behalf of the people. Their lives were dedicated to ministry on behalf of the people. They were go-betweens. And so our response is Jesus invites us to give our lives for the work of the Lord. That's his invitation. He invites us to give our lives for the work of the Lord. Pastor Steve asked this question earlier when he was talking about offering. How much of your life does God want? If you were to ask that question, I don't think you would like the answer. Because so many times we want to give the minimum so that we can give them, get the maximum from God. What's the least I could invest and receive God's blessing and receive his favor? The truth is, how much of your life does God want? He wants all of it. He wants every part. He wants a life that's fully surrendered with your giftings, with your time, with your treasure, with all you have. You become a steward of it saying, Lord, it's yours. We see this in the early church that their lives were so transformed that they reorientated everything for the sake of the gospel. Jesus is preparing his church to live a life of faithfulness, enduring difficulty, and making sacrifices so his truth can continue to be shared. And a relationship with Jesus is not about just making your life better, easier, healthier, or richer. It's saying, I've seen his power. I see his authority. I see his beauty and splendor. And I surrender my life to him. And when you surrender your life to him, what he begins to do in and through you is greater than anything you could ever do on your own. Would you bow your heads and pray with me today?